It begins in 1872 at the Knickerbocker Hotel in New York City. Led by Dr. Walter Fleming and actor William J. Florence, 13 Master Masons form a social club. For fun, they create a mysterious Near Eastern theme. It's called the Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, and the popularity soars. By 1880, there are 7,200 members and 48 temples. By 1900, there are 55,000 members and 82 temples. In 1922, they build the first hospital in Shreveport, Louisiana, and commit to the mission of helping children with polio. Soon, there are 22 hospitals, and the medical mission grows. This is the story of this extraordinary brotherhood and how it has changed the world. Shriners, a history of brotherhood and compassion. Well, as they say in the beginning, in the beginning when the shrine was formed, it, go back into the 1870s when uh, New York was uh, quite a popular place for just about everything going on in the world at that time. The Civil Wars ended and uh, uh, in America's biggest city, New York City, a group of Masons comes together who think that it's great to be a Mason, but that lodge meetings are a little bit on the stuffy, stale side. They meet regularly for lunch at a place called the Knickerbocker in New York City, Manhattan, and uh, decide that they need to form a, a club that will require you to be a Mason to be a member of it. We had two very prominent people who were really the movers and shakers to start the organization. Billy Florence, who was a a very famous and well-known actor at that time, and Dr. Fleming, who was a very prominent physician in New York City. They were familiar with some of the customs and culture of the Middle East, and they decided that they would wrap this club that they were about to form around an Arabian Nights sort of pageantry kind of theme. And so the ancient Arabic order nobles of the Mystic Shrine is born as a social club for Freemasons in New York City. It grows from there. The Fez comes from Morocco. The name of the city is Fez, Morocco. The emblems, the scimitar, the crescent, and, and so on, uh, is taken from basically the various parts of the Arabic nations. It was the mystique part of it, I think, that was intriguing uh, to a lot of people, both outside of, of masonry and, and, and inside as well, of course. Uh, and uh, that was, I think, a, a great drawing card. This is the way the men socialized. They quite often socialized without their wives, without their children, and so this was in keeping with what they did. But it was a great fellowship organization and they really knew how to give great banquets and had good cigars at their festivities and it was a lot of fun. In the various communities, wherever these shrine temples were located, they were very charitable, just like other parts of masonry, you know, had been in their basic blue lodges. In those days, you know, the, the charity really meant a, a, an awful lot to a lot of people because you didn't have the programs you have today uh, in there to take care of people who were in, in, in dire need, health-wise or otherwise. Some of our members went to serve and didn't come back. Some of our members went to serve and came back forever changed. Some of our citizens went to serve 
and came back and then were looking for something where they could continue fellowship with their comrades and many of them did choose the Masonic fraternity and eventually Shriners as, as their home. Eventually some of the members felt that maybe there needed to be a little bit more purpose than just having a good time. But we have to remember that the reason that the organization was founded was because Masons thought that lodge meetings were too stale and they needed to have an organization where they would have a good time. So there was quite a bit of back and forth for several years at our Imperial Council sessions over just what the Shriners ought to do. Freeling Kendrick was a, a great leader. He was a mover and a shaker. He was a very persuasive uh, individual, and he really felt that this organization, Shriners, should have a, 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 a one central charity uh, that uh, would benefit uh, what was needed so badly in society at that time, and that was for treatment of children with polio. In that day, Polio was the scourge of, of the nation. Many, many children were affected by polio and, and crippled for life. The bubble speech, that was a speech that was given at an Imperial Council session during a debate over whether a hospital should, should be founded by the Shriners and operated as a charitable institution. He sang a little bit of the song and quoted from it and challenged his fellow delegates to stop blowing bubbles and to finally do something about this. I was laying in bed yesterday morning about four o'clock. Some poor fellow who had strayed from the rest of the band stood down there under the window for 25 minutes playing I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. I'm forever blowing bubbles. I thought of the wandering minstrel and I wondered if there were not a deep significance in the tune that he was playing. While we've spent money for songs and spent money for bands, it's time for the Shrine to spend money for humanity. I want to see this thing started. Let's get rid of all the technical objections. And if there is a Shriner in North America who objects to having paid the $2 after he has seen the first crippled child helped, I will give him a check back myself. And indeed, they voted in 1920 to establish the first Shriners Hospital, and in 1922, the first hospital did open in Shreveport, Louisiana. So they were finished blowing bubbles, but they weren't finished having fun. But now it was fun with a purpose. And of course, after that hospital, then they kept building more and more and more uh, all across North America at that time. Well, the market crashes, people lose their fortunes, people lose everything they have, whether they had a fortune or not in some cases. And that makes it difficult for people to pay their dues. The Second World War, of course, has a greater impact because it was, from the United States standpoint, a much larger war. Uh, many, many more of our citizens were called to serve in the Second World War than in the first. As they come back and establish themselves and go to work and uh, establish families and settle down, there is a tremendous membership boost for Freemasonry and for Shriners. I came out of the Navy, I would fight a bear. You know, I was tough and rough and afraid of no man or beast. But it humbled me and, and I looked at myself and I said, what do you want to do with your life, man? Where are you going? It's difficult to sum it up in a few words, I guess, but uh, being a Shriner has given me that opportunity to do something for others. And that, that just about says it all. When you walk into a Shriner's hospital, it's real. It is the great reality show. And you know what you're seeing is the truth. There are hurting kids lying here and there may be 20 of them in here today. And they're being helped. And one of these days soon, they'll be up and out of those beds and they'll be going back home and they'll be running in the yard and playing, kicking a football or bouncing a basketball. And I'm a part of that, it's hard to believe.
One child told me, we don't have the problem, you've got the problem. And you know, that stuck with me for a long time. They don't have problems because they know that they're okay. We as Shriners have made them feel they're okay. Now, the lump in the throat, the smile in the heart, the beam of the eyes. When, you have to, when they say that to you, how can you not be proud of this fraternity? How can you not be proud every time you put this on your head? It's my life, <laughs> and it basically has been. It's, it's just been the meaningful thing in my life of doing something and being a part of an organization or a group that you feel like, I feel good. It's phenomenal. I've met people, in, not only in my own temple, but all over the country that I've never had a chance to meet had I not been a, a Shriner. We have a chance to travel. We do dances and, and social events here. Our clubs meet in this building and, and elsewhere around the area. And it's an opportunity to stay active, stay fit, stay involved in the community, uh, help out others. What more could you ask for? Well, my grandfather was, uh, I believe his first involvement was in, in Minneapolis, Zura Temple. He was potentate there in the 20s and then went on to be imperial potentate of the shrine in uh, 37 and 38, I believe. He had three sons. My dad was the youngest of those. Uh, all became shriners. We have a lot of camaraderie, a lot of fun. We have, we have unique things we do together like clown, ride horses, play music, and, and we have a we have the bond of the basic Masonic Brotherhood that, that makes it uh, just natural to, to be at ease with each other and, uh, and enjoy each other. It's, it's truly amazing what we've been capable and able to do. As I tell many of the nobles that I have an opportunity to speak with, that child wants to come up and thank you. They see that fez on your head and their whole life lights up. When that positive approach comes to you and wants to thank you, give you that hug, you know, that's what it's all about. You walk into a Shriners Hospitals for Children anywhere in the United States, or Mexico or Canada, of course. <laughs> it's a happy place. It's bright, it's lit, there's colors, people are laughing, the environment is so different. And I think you're starting to see now, other hospital systems have seen what that does. When you bring a positive energy and you bring a positive outcome, everything else flows. And it's just, it's like I said, I used to love going to the hospital. People don't say that. It's made me a better man. Uh, the Shine is a, is a real good organization. To my, my way of thinking, probably the tops. Whenever a noble actually visits our temple, uh, it's always a pleasure to actually give them a tour and provide the history of what the shrine is all about, especially when they come in and see the stage itself. The first reaction is always, I always look for that magic word, wow, because of the enormous building this is, and uh, as far as the rich history behind it also. The work that's done in our hospitals is amazing. We are, in, in certain areas, the areas where, where we specialize, we're the best in the world. We do things with burn patients that nobody else can do. And we do things with prosthetics that nobody else can do. We are blessed to be able to work with some very skilled surgeons and some very dedicated doctors and nurses and therapists. And, and it's, a, it's a whole child approach. It's more than repairing burned skin or fixing 
crooked bones. It's more than repairing a, a, a face that's been marred by cleft lip. And it's more than trying to help people who've been paralyzed because of spinal cord injuries someday walk again. In a lot of ways, uh, being a Shriner has made my life worth living. The Shrine is a fraternity with a purpose, and our purpose is our 22 hospitals. And we have fun with it, and uh, we ride little cars and the motorcycles, and we walk in the parades and we play music and horns and beat the drums and entertain kids with the Shriners. And so it is a philosophy of life. And I hope that it will be continued because it brought a lot of joy to me and a lot of pleasure. And, and a great feeling of being able to do something for someone less fortunate. I hope that opportunity never ceases to exist. We need it. It's needed by society. We need to take care of each other. Shriners has changed me many times in the 30 years that I've been a member of this organization. And just when you think that it can't happen again, that I've had all the life-changing experiences I'm gonna have from visiting a hospital or talking to a parent of one of our patients or the kids themselves. It happens again, it happens again. And I'm sure at this point that it's gonna to continue to happen uh, as long as I'm wearing a fez. We are a fraternity, we are a brotherhood, and we depend on each other. We're just mostly a bunch of fun-loving, and some of us are a little elderly now but we're gonna keep on laughing and scratching and having a good time as we go through life. Shriners Hospital for Children provide the finest medical care in the world, regardless of race, creed, color, or the ability to pay for those services. We all have a sense of pride in what we're able to give each child, but we get that sense of pride from the rest of the medical staff and certainly from the owners of the hospital. I mean, to see the owners so present in um, our everyday part of the hospital and see their guidelines being sent through our administration to us that, you know, uh, we want to do the best for each child. You go home and, and people ask, you know, what you do and, and you're able to tell them what the mission of the Shriners Hospital for Children's is. And you see this uh, almost uh, look of amazement. Shriners has done something that no one else has done to create a, a system of hospitals treating nothing but kids. That's their focus. And that's what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. These kids get the best care possible. I'm lucky to be a, a small part of that. When I was born, um, I probably wasn't the cutest baby to see since I was born without legs. And the nurses and doctors all got together and thought it would be best if I was put away in an institution. Remember, in the early 40s and 50s, this is what they did. And I always say that's when my life in sales began because I'd like five seconds to look in my mother's eyes and say, keep me, keep me. And she said, no, I'm going to take the baby home. The wonderful doctor back then told my mother about Shriners Hospital for Crippled Children in Portland. And mom thought, well, that would be great, but we're very poor, poor farming family. And he said, 
makes no difference, regardless of race, creed, or color, the whole thing that goes with Shriners. And it was decided that they would drive me up to Shriners Hospital in Portland. I went there for the first 15 years of my life, on and off. I was nine years old when I was fitted with my first artificial legs, and they were made out of wood, and they were very heavy. And the belt that went around your waist to keep them on was steel. First time I put them on, it was so exciting. Um, like I said, nine years old, fourth grade, I got to pick a dress, a store-bought dress, not one that my mother made, because I was too tiny. I got to pick real shoes that I picked out a month before so they could carve the wooden feet to fit the shoes. If it wouldn't have been for Shriners Hospital, I would still be that little girl walking around, probably just on the streets of Mount Angel, because I don't think I would have gotten to go to college. To me, they're still my Shrine Men, and I know this sounds horrible, but they will always be my Shrine Men. They literally, I don't think, know how much they do for people. I mean, they can see it, but you've got to be, to the other end, the reciprocant of what they've done. Um, and I'm just trying to tell them all the time, thank you, thank you. I don't think you can ever have a better place and environment than the Shriners Hospital for Children to really conduct the clinical research. And there is nothing more motivating or nothing that can really touch you, making a child who is unable to stand, unable to walk, to enable him to walk and stand. And if you just look at the face of this child smiling at you, you will understand how important it is clinical research. While I was living in Peru, I was uh, I was playing out in the street with some friends, and I slipped in the street and I was hit by a bus. Actually, the bus ran over my legs. I was very small, and uh, and it led to open fractures of my femurs, both of them. My family found out about Shriners Hospital uh, by consulting with a local orthopedic surgeon. After he made an evaluation, he thought that I needed some very high-level orthopedic care and that it would, be, it would best be done at a, at a place like Shriners Hospital rather than a local children's hospital. I always tried to talk to the doctors. I, I was sort of something, I found them interesting. Uh, and, and because of that, I was able to then get to know them and, and noting how they were so compassionate. They were very compassionate, warm-hearted people. So it was really, the, the, the experiences were profound. I actually get uh, emotional in a way because uh, I know that uh, they're part of an organization uh, that had a huge impact on my life, on my family life, on my professional life, on my emotional life, and on how I, I am today with patients. I don't know if I'd be an orthopedic surgeon, actually, if, if I hadn't been exposed to Shriners. So when I see a Shriner, I take the time to shake their hand and thank them and tell them that I was a patient at Shriners Hospital in Los Angeles and that they had a huge impact on my life. People come to me and say, how can my practices burn reconstruction? And I tell them that and they, they, you can see they kind of back off and say, how can you spend your life with, with children who've been burned? And I say, how can you not? It's the most rewarding thing possible because you're giving them hope. You're giving them the sense that they are important and that they will do well if I give them a chance. So I'm, you know, how, what a great opportunity for me to give chances to everybody.
I can't remember if I set the gas can down or if I was still holding it, um, but there was an explosion. It was just one minute I was here on this earth doing typical day-to-day -day things, and the next thing I knew, I was just surrounded by these flames. I stayed in the Charleston burn unit for two days, and they did not give my family any hope whatsoever that I would make it. The only thing they could say is, we're gonna keep him comfortable, but we've never seen any, any burn this, this size that, that survived. But my mother got a phone call and said, Joe's only hope is the Shriners Hospital for Children. I never felt, once I got there, never felt like I was going to lose my life. The hope was restored with my mother and my father, and, and they said, we're, we're going to help Joe, and, and they did. Couldn't ask for no better, not only for him, but us. My, my husband and me, he, they just, you know, went overboard helping us, trying to get us a place to stay, and you know, help him take care of us, and they took as well a care of us as they did of Joe. They didn't ask my family how much money they could pay the hospital. They just responded uh, with their life-saving techniques, with their care, and that's why I'm here today. Today, I'm married for 12 years to uh, my beautiful wife, Erin. I've got two amazing kids uh, that we both love, and uh, they, uh, they're just incredible. They saved his life, and not only that, but developed this spirit in him that is, it, it shows past the scarring, past the wheelchair. You know, you can see this, this, spirit in him that I know comes from the kind of care he was given and the kind of love he was shown by the staff members. It means everything to know he's happy and he's, he's capable of making a living on his own. He takes care of, good care of his family. Uh, I'm just, I'm amazed. They saved his life when everyone else gave his family no hope. So I you know, I am passionate, I'm very passionate about uh, raising funding and awareness for the Shriners Children's Hospital, and I'm just so grateful to them for saving his life and, and for helping him to become the man he is. The Shriners didn't give up on me, and, uh, and because of that, I was able to go on and, to, uh, and do some amazing things and have a productive life and have a great family. And, uh, and I love life. It's, you know, and I, and I owe it to the Shriners and, and, what, and the work that they do. They told us Brandon had just maybe one or two hours to live. We got two Shriners, and I felt different. They gave us all the hope that we needed. I remember Dr. Primary first saw her she came up and told me that not to worry about it, leave it on God's hand. And to my surprise, she gave me a hug and told me it's going to be all right. She told me if Brandon could hold on for two weeks, he'll make it. And he did. <laughs> the only way I could put it is that thanks to Shriners, I got my son. Actually, I want to say thank God that we landed on Shriners that I got my son. It was in January in 1965, and I was standing in front of an open gas stove to heat the living room, and my nightgown caught on fire. We lived in a row house, and I ran up and down banging on everyone's door when one of my neighbors came out and rolled me in the snow to put the fire out, and was left with burns over 65% of my body. Um, I went to a local hospital where connections were made for the Shriners Hospital in Cincinnati to come in on a private plane and take my burned body back to Cincinnati. 
I think that the staff at the Shriners Hospital for Children is so incredible that they don't let you see that that's a difficult time. And they literally, I want to say, enforced an attitude that you're no different than anybody else and you can be just as happy as anyone else. So therefore I was. Meeting Colleen for the first time, you would think that she would have been totally devastated with what occurred in her life. She had such a positive attitude, it was, you know, it just filled the room and I can only accredit, you know, the, the care that was given to her um, at the hospital and prepared her for what life, you know, was going to, to give to her. The life within her, you could just, you could just feel that presence. And while addressing our wedding invitations, I wrote a letter to the doctor who did my skin grafts and told him that I would be so honored if I could have my picture with him on my wedding day, especially because he made it all possible. Can I tell you, it was the first RSVP I got back. It was an absolutely awe-inspiring sight when we turned around after our vows and the back of the church was filled with, at the time, the divan from Syria along with uh, the chief surgeon from Cincinnati Hospital. It was just a sight to behold. As a young girl, my dream was to always be able to give back to all these smiling faces. And I didn't know how I was ever going to be able to do that. I have an opportunity to do things through the Daughters of the Nile that say I couldn't do individually. That we do, we sew for the hospitals, we do um, special crafts. My favorite project is tray favors because I think that it's very, very exciting for a child to wake up from surgery and see this little cutesy clown on their tray that's filled with candy and they have a treat as well as something nice to look at. So I absolutely love having that opportunity. I would like to say thank you very much for all you did for me and that I love each and every one of you. And on behalf of all the children in the Shriners Hospital, I know I speak for them when I say they thank you from the bottom of their heart. You cannot even imagine what you do for these children. It's a great thing for me to practice in, in the hospital like this and for all of the doctors on our medical staff is that we, we really don't have to consider what people can afford in order to provide them with the best treatment. We think that we're giving them the best treatment uh, regardless of what their financial circumstances are. And so that, that means that we are, we are filling a gap in the community that is, is really, really important. I was born with the lower right portion of my right arm missing and within uh, three months I was admitted into the Shrine system and was fitted with my first prosthetic arm. And so then for the next 19 years I was uh, part of the Shrine Hospital system. But that's really not the case because it's my whole life I'm always going to be a Shrine kid no matter how old I get. and. Uh, and I always consider myself part of the shrine. And I always joke, I say, okay, how many people here like to go to the hospital? Raise your hand. And nobody raises their hand. And I, and I say, well, you know what? I used to love to go to the hospital. When they found out I wanted to do sports, they would come up with very creative solutions for me to be able to do those sports. So it was never a limiting factor, like, well, you know, you really shouldn't do that, or, you know, that's really gonna destroy the prosthetic. You gotta be more careful. It's like, okay, how can we make this work? And what do we need to do to make this even better for you? Then in high school, I was really impressed with gymnasts. I thought that was an amazing sport and it's something I wanted to do. Well, again, I went to Shriners Hospital for Children and said, all right, because I had, I had a, a more cosmetic hand, kind of like I've got now, and uh, I broke it off right here at uh, the point, the junction point, and this thing was only like six months old, and the doctor looked at me and he goes, you keep breaking them, we'll keep replacing them, don't stop what you're doing. 
Now, how can I not be motivated to go out and do the best job I can as a gymnast because they're behind me, they've got my back, and they want me to succeed. I can't let them down. And I think by being part of the shrine, being a shriner, really, to me, it comes full circle. I, I was a child in need. There was a man out there that said, I can help you, supported by a fabulous fraternity and Shriners Hospital for Children care system that made it happen. I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to give back the same way it was given to me. And so I did. We're making a difference in the world one child at a time. And the Shrine and Shriners International and Shriners Hospitals for Children make that possible. I would like to thank the Shriners Hospital, uh, whether the Shriners and their ladies for all the support that they're giving us. They are working behind the scenes. Very often uh, people are unaware of the time they give, the care they give, the unconditional love that they give to the children. The patients are part of our family. We all work together toward that goal. I think that's why most of us are here. Compassion is an easy word to use, but it's something that um, it's got to be genuine. And I think we self-select the people who work here uh, because that's important to them, to, important to us, to, to have that ability to express the compassion in both directions, regardless of culture, regardless of age, size, magnitude of the injury. This system, you know, it, it needs to always exist. Because without this system, again, you know, the children's not gonna get this care. It far exceeds any other system that's out there. Because again, they, they get to the heart of a child uh, and they help keep that spirit intact. More than anything, I wanna say thank you but I want you to know that the Shriners Hospital for Children are absolutely the best. The Shriners Hospitals uh, for Children, they, uh, the, the actions that, that are put forth by the staff are, are tremendous and they can have a huge impact on people just like they had on me, so I have to thank them for all they did. Shriners Hospital has always been home. I have two homes, so I'm very lucky. As far as in my life, the whole family made a difference and Shriners Hospital made a big difference. These are the most dedicated people that you will ever meet because they love what Shriners Hospitals for Children stands for, what we do, and how we do it for our kids. So be no mistake about it, this is the finest medical care that these children can receive in the world.